So the costs of production go down, the subscription costs go up, somebody's making a pile of money. In fact, it's a scientific or academic publisher who is number three on internet commerce globally. Okay? So what's happened? Academia sold its soul to the devil. Okay, it's a Faustian bargain. Academia took a short-term gain and lost everything. And so now, I'm gonna give you some examples of how the scientific literature is off limits to scientists. You guys know this very well. This talk I usually show to colleagues in the US because they don't know. And I say to them, just take your laptop and go to an internet cafe downtown, wherever you live, where you're not on your university campus. And then all of a sudden it clicks, okay? My university pays four and a half million dollars per year to get us journal access. Every university across the US, every university across Europe, and in fact, every university worldwide pays some big amount of money, some more, some less. If you don't have very good access in your institution, it's because your institution pays less, okay? So I took my department's um, publications between 2001 and 2009, and I made a frequency histogram of number of publications per journal. And so most of this room will be happy to see that the number one journal in which my colleagues published was American Journal of Botany. And after that, Journal of the Kansas Entomological Society. So, um, I did an experiment. I chose 10 publications by my colleagues, each in a different journal. And I contacted 50 colleagues around the world. And I said to each one of them, please, go to your office and do everything you can to get a final PDF copy of each of these 10. And report back to me, you know, yes, no, yes, 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 no. Which ones could you get and which ones couldn't you? And this is the result. Really, really interesting is that no journal was universally accessible. None, not one. The very best two, somebody missed. Notice also that these publications that have stayed as small society publications are the big losers. More than half of the people in my network of colleagues couldn't get to those journals. Here's another view of the same thing this is essentially the percent success that individuals had around the world. And you see, in North America, a lot of people did very well. But notice, they weren't completely successful. There's only two European colleagues who managed to get all 10 of the publications. And then, around the world, you can see some people who really, really are suffering for access to the literature. Okay? So it's a pretty crippling message that given the system that we allowed to buy us, now no journal is universally accessible and almost none of 50 colleagues are able to get to all the literature. How many of you have published a paper? Raise your hand, come on. Felina. Okay. When you published that paper, did you read the copyright agreement? Anybody? Did you read the agreement? Yes. yes. You did, okay. What did you think of it? You translate it to the public. Yes. Okay, so, yeah, that's actually really good. Rarely do I have people say, yes, I read it. Most of the time it's just, ah, Thank God they accepted my paper and it's going to be published. Well, if you look at these agreements, they're pretty impressive in terms of what they take away from you. 
Now here's a really good one. University of California Press is quite good. You can use your article. You can use your article. Just get the language. Providing you acknowledge the publication and you don't sell it. Okay? That's, that's going to be pretty much okay. Here's a worse one. Copyright assignment includes without limitation the right to reproduce, publish, distribute, transmit, make available, and store the article, including the abstracts. You have given up that right. Okay? You can self-archive a pre-publication version but only after 12 months. This is a great one. I hereby assign the copyright of this material to the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. The society will have the exclusive right of publishing, disseminating electronically, and get this, disposing of the article. Okay? The authors shall not grant the right to print, publish, copy, or store electronically any part of the article to any person. So you need to think about what is copyright, and actually it's five sets of rights. It's the right to reproduce your work, to adapt your work, to distribute it, to perform it, and to display it. This is very gen general and generic. To me, this is the, the most interesting one. Everything that I do now, in some sense, is derivative of what I was doing five years or 10 years or 20 years ago. I can't think of doing a study and publishing it now that doesn't, in some sense, derive from a previous study. The strictest interpretation of these copyrights is that if you don't own copyright, you can't for example, perform or display that work, that's called a seminar. Okay, that's called a presentation to your colleagues. But we just saw a bunch of publication agreements where we very blithely sign away all rights to those publications. That's a very, very serious thing. Just to give you one idea. If Springer decides the entire future of that article, what if Springer goes bankrupt? Or what if Springer decides to turn off their servers? That can happen, and they own everything. Okay, Elsevier has more than 3,000 scientific, oh, academic journals. Who owns the research? Well, a lot of people would say you do, because you created it, you imagined it, you dreamed it. Your institution, maybe your institution pays your salary, so maybe they, in some sense, own it. Your funder, well, they pay for the research to happen. But notice who ends up owning it. Now, I'll give the journals some credit. They have the reputation. They are the forum, they keep up the, the distribution facilities, and they do put time and money into formatting and distributing the, the paper. But are they the only ones who should own research? No. In reality, everybody around the table has some claim to ownership. So obviously the publishers want to obtain exclusive rights because that means they get all the money. You know, again, we pay four and a half million dollars a year for access, and every other institution around the world pays that much or more or less. Just remember this. Journals earn the maximum amount, amount if you give them the copyright. So we've been experimenting. A bunch of institutions have been experimenting with opening access. It's not easy because you, know, you need to publish your work. And in some senses right now, the two options that you have are either 
pay to publish in an open access journal versus allow a commercial publisher to publish your work and they will close the access. It'll be pay to read, okay? So the University of Kansas and more recently the University of California and I think we're up to 50, 52 institutions around the US and Canada have been experimenting with what we call open access policies. And essentially this is the author of the work argues with the publisher, debates with the publisher to retain enough rights, not all the rights, but enough rights to be able to put a copy of the work out there on the internet openly. And what we've found, essentially this is before and after we passed our open access policy and put out tons and tons of, of papers on the internet, this is the uh, viewing rate before, and this is the viewing rate after. So it basically comes down to the fact that by putting a lot of scholarly literature online, more and more people started visiting our institutional repository. So it does make a difference. And I looked up all the countries that had accessed the publications of my department, and it comes out a few years ago to 126 countries. So what I'm after is we do have solutions. They're not easy because we sold our souls to the devil. Okay, the academic soul has been sold to the devil. So the partial conclusion, sorry, is that open access to the scientific literature translates into a much broader readership and almost certainly much greater impact. But there are broad constituencies who have only partial access to the scientific literature because of this system that we've fallen into. So what does this mean as far as what we've been talking about this week? I'm going to emphasize something that I call digital accessible knowledge. Okay? There are lots and lots of data out there. And remember, we've talked about um, how most of the data on your countries do not reside in your countries, but rather mainly in Europe and North America. A lot of those data are not digital, or they're not shared, or they're in non-standard digital formats. So the fact that a database exists somewhere else, maybe just handwriting on a paper tag, that's a data set, doesn't do us much good, doesn't do you much good in terms of being able to understand biodiversity. So the assertion is that if the data are not digital and if the data are not made accessible in the best of formats, they don't exist. You can make them exist. You can make a difference. That's what this whole course is about. But as long as the data are in analog format, or as long as the data are in digital format and somebody's doing this, they don't exist. So let's think about where we lose digital accessible knowledge. There's biodiversity out there, right? Right outside this door and in uh, primary forest within a few hundred kilometers of here. Biodiversity is out there and we're trying to accumulate knowledge about it. And so over the centuries, lots of scientists have gone out and sampled biodiversity. And some of that sampling has gotten lost, right? A museum, uh, goes without care and the specimens get lost or maybe an individual researcher 